Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his essay, Concrete Approaches to Investigating the Ontological Mystery, Gabriel Marcel is going to begin by looking at something that he thinks is particularly characteristic of modern life, but is, is an ever-present problem or danger for human beings, because it's a, it's a possibility. And that is of reducing ourselves and what it is that we do, what we think, what we feel, how we relate ourselves to others, how we understand ourselves, to a matter of what he calls functions. And, and the word in French is just merely fonction. It's, it's a cognate to our word function. It has really the same uh, semantic range. The idea is that we reduce ourselves to our, our roles or what it is that we're supposed to do. You might say, in some cases, our job description and all of the bullet points underneath it. Um, those are what we call functions. And this is a very broad term, but there's, there's a lot of characteristics that functions are going to have in common that we'll look at in a moment. Now, why does he begin with this? Because he thinks that a world that has been essentially reduced to or oriented by what he calls the notion of function is a, a very impoverished world, a world in which the people living in it don't even realize how impoverished their existence becomes, and it blocks the way to what he calls the ontological mystery and our ontological need for that. So he says that I'm going to begin with a sort of global and intuitive characterization of persons for whom any sense of being or the ontological is lacking. And it's not like a, a you know genetic defect or something like that. This is something that has been prevented, something that's been corrupted, something that's been taken away from them. He says, more exactly, who have lost consciousness of having any such dimension to their lives. This is the way, he says, most modern men and women are. And if a need for a sense of being affects them at all, it's in a muted way as a vague uneasiness. And he talks about two things before we go on that are, that are worth bringing up here. He says that there are many people for whom the ontological need has not been entirely stamped out. They haven't been solely reduced to functions, but the problem is they can't articulate it. They live in an environment where anytime that something like that starts to burst through, it's tamped down. There's no place for it to fit within that system. The other thing that's particularly interesting, and he brings this up twice during this essay is that he's using the term psychoanalysis, but we could think of any sort of analysis of a person's life using the resources of philosophy. He says that, um, I wonder if a psychoanalysis, one more, one deeper and more nuanced than what has been developed to date, would not succeed in revealing the morbid effects engendered by the repression of this sense, this need so unfortunately misunderstood. So he's not endorsing psychoanalysis. He's actually saying that much of the psychoanalysis that we encounter is about reducing people to their functions. So let's, let's jump into that idea. He tells us that today's world is characterized by an orientation or if you want to look at the French, désorbitation, literally making things revolve around or orbit or, uh, you know, tie into um, the notion of function. And he says, I'm using this word function in its generally accepted sense. It includes vital functions, social functions. He'll talk about psychological functions in just a, a moment as well. And what is a world like that like? 
He says that one key feature of it is that not, not only is the individual treated as if he or she is merely a, a aggregate or a sort of nexus of their functions, the individual comes to perceive, to feel, to think about him or herself precisely in that way as an aggregate of functions. And if we pause here for just a moment and think about how this comes to, to pass, from an early age within many of our modern societies, we are encouraged to think of ourselves in terms of the information that people have or produce about us. So in you know school, we have our grades. And nowadays, if you're a parent, you can go into the parent portal or whatever it happens to be called for your school and see whether your kids are doing well on their assignments. And sometimes there's feedback and sometimes there's not. And there's this tendency for, for us to you know, talk about people as if they're this function or this set of functions. This is, this is my child. He is a reflection of me, right? Um, he got an A on the test. What a smart kid. Uh, not doing so well in gym class. Um, captain of the football team. Pick whatever you want. You know, first clarinet in the band. All of these are things that they don't, there's nothing wrong with this, but they're not the, the person, him or herself, right? And there's this tendency to, to view ourselves in terms of our functions. I'm a father. I'm a professor. I'm a, uh, apartment dweller. I'm a person in front of this chalkboard shooting videos for you. All of these can become what it is that we take ourselves as being. And particularly when we inhabit environments where other people are viewing things the same way and where there's a lot of pressure to regard yourself in that way, where there's practical effects if you don't, if you buck against that, it's difficult to, to resist that and, and to not slip into that. And it happens gradually. So he talks about functions. Let's come back to this. He says, first of all, there are the vital functions. It's hardly necessary to point out the reductionist influence on the concept of humanity exercised by historical materialism. He's talking about the entire Marxist tendency. But we could think of all sorts of other types of historical materialisms as well. Uh, modern economics, that's non-Marxian, treats people just as reductionistically as any Marxist might have as a historical materialist. Reducing you down to the consumer that you are is, is, is that way, right? Um, or Freudian theories he talks about on the other, and we might talk about other things, modern neuroscience, cognitive behavior therapy. There are tendencies to similarly reduce the vital functions down to uh, some sort of you know, manageable uh, theory, right? And he says, then there's social functions. Consumer is a function, right? Um, producer, citizen, and we might run through all sorts of other things. Uh, in our own social media saturated environment, reproducer through sharing. Uh, you know, that could be another example of a function. And all of these are things that do describe what we, we are <clears throat> or what we do. They're not false in that sense, but they're not the totality of it. And then he says, between these, there should be at least theoretically a place for psychological functions. In his own time, he says, very often these psychological functions are interpreted in either in terms of vital functions. Oh, your brain chemistry is off. Let's give you some chemicals. And that'll re, you know, realign the, the functions that are out of whack right now. Um, or you know, make sure that you eat plenty of fish oil for your brain so that you feel creative, right? Have some, some uh, beer at the times that you want to be creative and some coffee at the time that you want to be productive. Those are ways of reducing psychological functions down to vital functions. We can think of the whole realm of sexuality in that way as well. All the manuals about how to do this sort of technique or that sort of technique, ignoring the fact that it's really important for partners who want to have intimacy to actually you know, be on a page other than manual manipulation of the parts of the body, right? Um, he also says that, that quite often these psychological functions are interpreted in terms of social functions. He says their autonomy as psychological functions become precarious. 
Their specificity is contested. And then he goes on and he says something really interesting. He, he's looking at this phrase and following it up as if it's sort of a, a leading clue about what is really going on. He says, let's look at this notion of the use of one's own time. This is even more applicable in our own present when we constantly have everywhere you go, uh, not only evidence of what time it is or what time is being taken in the form of digital readouts, but where our lives are also permeated by um, so many other things that are divided up into hours, half hours, quarter hours, seconds, minutes, things along those lines. You know, you might think about your calendar as you use it. If you do, in fact, have a day planner or I use Google Calendar for that. It's sending me alerts all the time. It's parceling out what is my time. If I go and sit in a waiting area, there's guaranteed to be some stupid TV show on because everybody's got televisions and they tune into the lowest common denominator, DREC, and those will be talking about things at the top of the hour and the half hour. Um, that is all a matter of, of functionalization as Marcel is, is talking about it. And he goes on and he, he, he discusses this notion of the use of one's time. Precise amounts of time are allotted for various functions. Sleep is a function, one that must be carried out if other functions are to be formed properly, right? Um, you get the, the right amount of sleep. Okay, eight hours for you, nine hours for you, five hours for you. Maybe you're a little manic, right? Um, he also says that we dole these out for the right amount of relaxation, the right amount of exercise, the right amount of this. And, and you think about the ways in which people try to manage their time and the ways in which their time is managed by other people. Particularly in our new economy, where if you're a minute late for something that you, you've got as a gig, people start getting all upset. How is that the case? Well, they know what time it is, and they expect your time to be used in that way. He says, we can imagine a healthcare specialist prescribing a person needs so many hours of recreation per week. It's simply a psycho-organic function that can no more be neglected than the sexual functions, for example. And he says, no need to elaborate further. This sketches the picture. The one thing that he says is essential to this is that there is a schedule. So functionalization and schedules go hand in hand. What are the effects of this? He, he discusses how this ends up changing us, affecting us, reducing us in some way. He talks about moments of disorder or rupture. And he says, these are going to occur, accidents, sickness, and what happens then? Something like a tune-up. You get brought in and there's some sort of regulation. We're not going to have this happen again. We're going to make sure that you follow this routine just so you can make sure that you're continuing on as this sort of uh, person, this sort of person, this sort of person. You know, uh, think about how when you fire somebody these days in so many places, you have to have a plan in place that, you know, brings to their attention what it is that they did, and then they have to, you know, uh, say how they're going to change their behavior, and then you, you know, check it every so often. Uh, a lot of times these are actually fudged, right? But um, this is an example of what Marcel is talking about. Um, he says that from this point of view, uh, you know, a person is, is, is treated as sort of a machine. And he says, when it comes to death, from this objective and functional point of view, it appears only as ceasing to function, falling into total uselessness, becoming sheer waste to be discarded. There's no longer any real meaning to death. People move on. Or they observe the proper rituals, and those are functionalized as well. A um, great example of this is, of course, the funeral industry, where they put on you know, fake smiles uh, in order to sell you very expensive accoutrements like caskets and urns, and you, know, you have to go into their stylized parlor that, that stinks 
uh, flowers and dry cleaning and then, you know, follow the rituals and everybody must speak in hushed tones. Those are actually functions. You can do that. You can walk that walk without give, giving a, you know, a care about what you're, you're actually doing. You can compartmentalize in that way. It's, it's quite possible and many people do that. This ceasing to function thing is, is quite important. He says, it doesn't just have to be death. Consider the heartbreaking image of a person who has been retired. Why? Why? What's wrong with retirement? Well, for a lot of people, retirement means the loss of their meaning as a person. This is why so many people soon after they retire, not only disappear, but die or languish. It's possible to do quite otherwise, isn't it? But for people who have been so tied up in their work, retirement becomes a sort of small and long lingering death. They're also cut off from the people who they would normally interact with for the most part. Um, what this produces, he says, is a world that is empty, a world that is hollow. He says a world such as this is a sad spectacle, not only for the one who observes it, there's also the unspoken and intolerable uneasiness felt by those who see themselves reduced to living as if they were nothing more than their functions. Why would they be uneasy? Because as soon as your functions go away, you go away. There is no, no you apart from your functions if you view things this way. And that will induce a, a uneasiness or anxiety. So it's an empty, hollow world. A little bit later in the essay, he talks about this as a world of despair. Why? Um, he says that, uh, here we go, um, the world uh, of, of uh, functions is, is a, a world of despair. Such betrayal, it seems, is counseled, if not imposed, by the very structure of a functionalized world. The functionalized world is not a neutral environment that we can either take or leave. It imposes itself upon us. And, you know, you could say that it's, it's a, an entire set of risks, existential risks. He goes on and he says a few other things about this that are particularly important. A little bit later on, he talks about the relationship between function and problems. And he says that, the world of the functions is a world that is filled or literally, uh, uh, you know, full of, um, packed to the gills with problems, not mysteries. There's no room for something going beyond that. Now, a problem is something that can be formalized, something that can be set out. It could be a problem that's theoretical. It could be a problem that's practical. But it's something that can be dealt with by what, what Marcel is calling techniques, or the earlier translation of this was techniques. So think about technology, think about disciplinary knowledge, think about uh, bureaucratic ways of doing things, think about uh, all the different ways in which we find a mode to solve a problem and to keep on solving that problem over and over again. Those are what he's calling techniques. Um, so it's, it's a world that, that is filled with, with problems. He goes on and he tells us about techniques. Um, the world of the problematical is, is the world where techniques of whatever kind reign supreme. There is no technique that is not or could not be put directly at the service of a given desire or given fear. And conversely, every desire and every fear will tend to create techniques geared towards its own end. Desire and fear are intimately connected with the problematic. And those aren't, the, those aren't bad emotions to feel or bad affectivities to have. But the person who lives primarily in terms of functions and in terms of problems is going to be motivated primarily by desire and fear. And the other emotions will in fact be either breaks from that or just other modes of those. There are ways in which a person can be happy, but their happiness is not really joy. It's really just a mode of desire or it's a shaky kind of happiness that really reflects fear underneath and a technique is helping them coast along for the time being. 
Um, he tells us that, that humans are capable of what their technical abilities can accomplish, but at the same time, we cannot recognize that technical achievements are unable to save us from ourselves and even appear susceptible to conclude the most sinister alliances with the enemy that each one of us carries within ourselves. He talks about being taken over by techniques. And think about somebody who found, for example, that downloading an app and following its dictates and you know entering the little data helped their life improve in some way, perhaps to lose weight or to become more productive or to start sleeping on a regular schedule. And now they start applying that mentality to everything. Why can't I apply this to my dating? There's apps for that. I could track everybody instead of carrying a little black book, which by the way itself, the old school little black book is just a set of techniques as well, isn't it? Or an apparatus for techniques of seduction. Well, I can carry that on my phone. Why do I need to, to do anything on my own? I can find an app to guide me along, to nudge me. Well, that's, that's turning things into techniques and turning things into problems that might indeed be mysteries. When it comes to weight loss, for example, it's quite often important to figure out why a person remains at the weight that they do. There are so many people who are heavy so that they can be, for example, invisible, right? Or because they didn't deal with a trauma or something like that. That's not the same thing as a problem that can be solved. That is more like what Marcel is calling a mystery that would require a more personal type of reflection and intervention. Um, he also does tell us, and this is a back to, to the, the earlier part, that the world of, of techniques and the world of, of functions is also what he calls the world of the purely natural. He says that this world is saturated with problems. Um, for the moment, I want to point out that to eliminate or try to eliminate mystery is, uh, in the functionalized world we've described, to apply to events that rupture the course of human existence, birth, love, death. The psychological and pseudo-scientific category of the purely natural. He says, this category is the vestige or shadow of a degenerate rationalism in which the cause accounts for the effect that is totally explains it. So when we try to say things are purely natural, we often don't have a clear sense of what that means other than the fact that, well, if it is natural, I should be able to apply the sciences or technology or some sort of discipline to it and organize it and categorize it. So what Marcel is sketching out for us here is not just a small problem, a little failure that goes on. This is one of the possibilities for the modern condition. And it's something that we, we have to stay on guard against. And we can only do that when we are able to reflect on what's missing here in the world of functions.